out of the tree of life I just picked me a plum You came along and everything started to hum Still it's a real good bet the best is yet to come The best is yet to come and babe won't it be fine You think you've seen the sun, but you ain't seen it shine. Reclaiming our heritage of liberty, we believe, requires two major structural reforms. First, we the people need to exert our popular sovereignty. And second, the American political process should be exclusively for American citizens. And that is all who should be legally permitted to donate to a campaign. We anticipate exerting our popular sovereignty as quickly as possible after our citizen president's inauguration. Every citizen will be issued a national voting card. The card will resemble and function just like a bank debit card we are all now so familiar with. The only difference might be the greater security of a voter's personal identity through the employment of three or more identification codes. Since debit and credit cards can so smoothly facilitate trillions of financial transactions daily, certainly a very similar system can be made to work for national voting. Before proceeding with our vision for electronic direct democracy, let us acknowledge the resolution of two immediate problems by the creation of a national electronic system for voting. First, the system itself would immediately give every citizen the federally enforced right to vote. The United States is one of the few countries among those that elect representatives that do not have an explicit right to vote in its constitution. Voting in the United States is a state right, not a citizenship right, and as a result, 13,000 separate and unequally administered voting jurisdictions exist to set the rules for tabulating votes and for who can be on the ballot. Inevitably, sometimes there are delays in counting votes, or there is the failure to count votes, or machines break down, or votes have to be discarded due to some inability of the machine to read a voting card. All of that would be swept away by a federally run electronic system. Second, the terrible inconvenience of having to go to a designated physical location with possibly a lengthy wait in line to cast a ballot would be rendered a bygone of the past. A voter would not have to leave their home or the office to vote and could vote as easily as it is to buy or sell equities online. To continue with our vision of citizen empowerment, our citizen president perhaps once or twice a month on a Sunday evening, will make a presentation on some such topic similar to the presentations on this website. Over the following week, citizens may reflect upon the topic, talk it over with family, relatives, and friends, debate the topic in numerous formats, rerun the video of the President's presentation, and consider various commentaries that no doubt will be offered from numerous sources. Beginning at 8 p.m. the subsequent Friday evening, the National Electronic Voting Booth will be open to collect the votes of every American citizen for a period of 48 hours, closing on Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Because the voting would be electronically tabulated, the vote would be spontaneous and free from human or mechanical error. Voting, limited to Tuesdays, during the typical work week, and lasting for only about 12 hours is a hardship that cannot be too quickly replaced. The vote could be on anything, a predetermined percentage of the electorate or the president alone places on the referendum agenda. We suggest two classifications of decisions. The primary classification would be decisions of significant import, like proposed changes to the tax system, decisions regarding the use of military force, and proposals to make a structural change to the system of government, like abolition of the Electoral College, or the imposition of term limits for members of Congress. 
we suggest such decisions should require a supermajority of 66.67% of the vote or more for approval. The secondary classification would be decisions on anything else, like a vote on whether or not to end subsidies for industrial agriculture, a vote on whether or not to impose a national addendum to all corporate charters, decisions on all the vexatious social issues. We suggest such decisions should require a majority of 55 percent of the vote or more for approval. Decisions that receive a vote approval of 55 to 60 percent would be considered settled law and not able to be reconsidered for five years. Voter approval between 60% and 66.67% would be considered settled law and not able to be reconsidered for 10 years. Supermajority votes would be considered a matter of settled law for 20 years before eligible for a reconsideration. We suggest the imposition of a lapse of time before a vote can be submitted for reconsideration and a 55% voter approval because we believe it would be counterproductive for the common good to have a controversial subject like one of the social issues constantly reappearing on the national referendum agenda as each side tries to pull just enough votes on the next vote to turn the law. A simple majority that splits the country is too close for comfort because we cannot have decisions potentially flipping back and forth every other year. Of course, a supermajority can always elect to overrule the required time lapse. Additionally, a supermajority at any time can vote to reconsider anything. So if, for example, a policy that had received a 62% approval and therefore was not eligible for reconsideration for 10 years, a supermajority could at any time overrule the 10-year requirement in the event the policy had unforeseen consequences the electorate did not want to endure. Upon passage, the popular decision would immediately become the supreme law of the land, for which Congress, the Supreme Court, nor any state or local government would have the authority to alter or impede or jurisdiction to overrule. The President would be empowered to enforce the decision by the appropriate exercise of executive power. It is obvious that our nation's 300 million citizens cannot be brought together to replace the vast Washington bureaucracy to formally implement rules and regulations, impose fines and penalties, conduct inspections, investigate complaints, hold hearings to determine compliance or noncompliance. Nor can we all come together to replace Congress by drafting and voting on every bill. But modern technology allows us to come together to determine our nation's directions and policies. The second reform in citizen empowerment is that the only participation in the American political process should be American citizens, and that is all who should be permitted to donate to a campaign up to a certain amount of perhaps $500 per candidate in each election cycle accompanied by full public disclosure. No corporations, no unions, no wealthy donors, no public or private organizations, no lobbyists, no political action committees, no special interests, and of course no foreigners. Only individual American citizens should be participants in the American political system. While most Americans champion the rule of law and defend the principle of one citizen, one vote, most Americans are also disturbed when a multimillionaire, unable to attract any significant grassroots support, bullies his or her way into the political arena and commands serious attention only because a personal fortune, not a profundity of ideas, opens the door. The idea that the First Amendment, intended to protect a right of the very rich and artificial entities of law like corporations, to dominate the political system with money is to turn the principles of the American Revolution on its head. America's founders understood that public spirit was a fragile thing, susceptible to erosion by the corrupting forces of luxury, wealth, and power, 
and if left to concentrate in few hands, would dominate government, secure special privileges, and deprive the people of their right to rule. As Jeff Milchin, co-founder of the American Independent Business Alliance notes, allowing wealth to readily translate to political power at dollar amounts beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest precludes a government that serves the broader public interest. The contention that such donors are merely exercising their free speech rights is historically inaccurate. The vast sums they contribute and the money spent on media campaigns are propaganda intended to disorient public opinion while drowning out any substantive debate. This assures the exclusion of the overwhelming majority of citizens from any real influence in the political life of the country. We must realize the obvious. In politics, the buying power of paid speech by corporations abridges the free speech rights of citizens by drowning it out. As explained by historian Forrest MacDonald, the origin of free speech has nothing to do with campaign finance. Under the common law, both freedom of speech and liberty of the press had specific and restricted meanings. Freedom of speech, for the most part, referred not to a civil right, but to a parliamentary privilege. Beginning during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the House of Commons had claimed for its members the right to speak without fear of retaliation from the Crown, and that right was confirmed in the English Bill of Rights. The same right was claimed by the American colonial legislatures throughout the 18th century, but neither Parliament nor the colonial assemblies extended the privilege to non-members. Criticism of the legislative bodies or of royal officials, along with dissenting religious opinions, was rigorously suppressed. Further, as author Ted Nace has written, the meaning of the word person, as it had been applied to corporations both in England and the United States, had always meant the functional ability to make contracts and to own property, and to use the courts to enforce contracts and property claims. The notion that by some perversion of the meaning of words, the spirit of the American Revolution can be twisted to confer an unlimited right to contribute to political campaigns is absurd. To oppose the public's sovereign authority through direct democracy is to effectively place oneself in sedition against the underlying principle of the American Revolution and the legitimacy of the United States government. It is an absurdity to hold as sacrosanct various institutions of government, while at the same time denigrating the source of those institutions' authority. But even if the public's choice could be labeled as wrong, under the principles of our system of government, it is the public's choice to make, right or wrong. It matters not whether any elitist thinks the public's choices will be wrong. The public, under the American theory of government, is sovereign. And that should settle the question. They sold us the big lie that we have a representative form of government, in that we vote for a political party, and the people that we vote for then represent our interests. Only six-year-olds believe that kind of stuff. The only people the politicians represent are the people that give them the most amount of money and have the most amount of power. So what we're saying is put the power in the hands of the people. Repre the representative democracy was something that came about as the, as the monarchies and dictatorships kept falling in the 18th and 19th century, and even the early 20th century. So what they did was they threw crumbs to the people by saying that you could vote for parties and you'll have a voice. You're still voting for the, the same interest, the same power interest, by voting for representatives. What respectable adult would believe that any of these politicians have a brain bigger than they do? So put the power in our hands. This could be the global game changer.